This is a story about a voice and a voice hearer. And it begins with me as an anxious teenager leaving home to go to university. Now, these were happy days at first. I'd done well at school, expectations for me were high, and I eagerly entered the student life of lectures, parties, and traffic cone theft. Now, underneath this veneer, I was actually deeply unhappy and emotionally insular, but I was skilled at hiding it. And it was with considerable surprise when I was joined in my second term by a new presence, a disembodied voice which calmly narrated everything I did in the third person. She is reading, she is going to a lecture, she is leaving the room. It was neutral, banal, oddly companioned, although I did notice it sometimes mirrored my own unexpressed emotion. So, for example, if I was angry and had to hide it, which I often did, being very adept at concealing how I really felt, then the voice sounded frustrated, but otherwise it was neither sinister nor disturbing. Now, it was then that I made a fatal mistake in that I mentioned the voice to a friend, and she was horrified. Her implication was that I should immediately seek medical help, which I did, and which proved to be mistake number two. Now, I spent some time telling the campus GP about what I perceived to be the real problem. Anxiety, low self-worth, fears about the future, and was met with bored indifference until I mentioned the voice, upon which he dropped his pen, swung round, and began to question me with a show of real interest. And to be fair, I was desperate for interest and help, and I began to tell him about my strange commentator. And I always wish at this point the voice had said she is digging her own grave. I was referred to a psychiatrist who also took a grim view of the voice's presence, subsequently interpreting everything I said through a lens of latent insanity. So, for example, I was part of a student TV station that broadcast news bulletins around the campus. And during an appointment, which was running very late, I said, I'm sorry, doctor, I've got to go. I'm reading the news at six. Now, it's down in my medical records. Eleanor has delusions that she's a television news broadcaster. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it was at this point that events began to rapidly overtake me. A hospital admission followed, the first of many. A diagnosis of schizophrenia came next. And then, worst of all, a prolonged and toxic sense of hopelessness and despair about myself and my prospects that tormented me beyond endurance and drained me through humiliation, helplessness and loss of self-respect into a shadow of myself. But having been encouraged to see the voice, not as an experience, but as a symptom, my fear and resistance towards it intensified. And this essentially represented taking an aggressive stance against my own mind, and in turn, the voices increased. One voice became 12 and grew progressively menacing and hostile, setting me bizarre tasks, ordering me to harm myself as I grew increasingly demoralized and disempowered. Two years later, and I had the whole frenzied repertoire. Terrifying voices, grotesque visions, bizarre, intractable delusions. My mental health status had been a catalyst for verbal abuse, discrimination, and physical and sexual assault. And I've been told by my psychiatrist, Eleanor, you would be better off with cancer, because cancer is easier to cure than schizophrenia. I'd been labeled, I'd been medicated, and I'd been left. And by now, I was so tormented by my voices that I attempted to drill a hole in my head in order to get them out. Now, six minutes is not enough time to fully credit those good and generous people who fought with me and for me and who waited to welcome me back from that agonized, lonely place. But together, they forged a blend of courage, creativity, integrity, and an unshakable belief that my shattered self could become healed and whole. And crucially, they helped me to understand what I'd always suspected, that my voices were a meaningful response to painful life events, particularly childhood events, and as such, were not my enemies, but a source of insight into solvable emotional problems. And so, ultimately, I gathered together my splintered self, each fragment represented by a different voice. And I went back to psychiatry, only this time from the other side. I returned to study and gained the highest degree in psychology that the university had ever given, and one year later, the highest master's, which I always say isn't bad for a nutter. In fact, during, <laughs> in fact, during uh, my stats exam, one of the voices actually dictated the answers, which technically possibly counts as cheating. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
I worked in the NHS, I spoke at conferences, I published book chapters and academic papers, and I argued and continue to do so that an important question in psychiatry shouldn't be what's wrong with you, but rather what's happened to you. And all the while, I listened to my voices, with whom I'd finally learned to live with peace and respect, and which in turn represented a growing sense of compassion, acceptance and respect towards myself. I'm now very proud to be part of the International Hearing Voices Movement, an initiative inspired by the work of Professor Marius Rom and Dr. Sandra Escher, which locates voice hearing as a creative and ingenious survival strategy, a sane reaction to insane circumstances, not as an abstract symptom of illness to be endured, but as a complex, significant, and meaningful experience to be explored. As Peter Levine has said, the human animal is a unique being endowed with an instinctual capacity to heal and the intellectual spirit to harness this innate capacity. In this respect, I would like the TED audience to be aware of two things. Firstly, that as members of society, there is no greater honour than facilitating that process for someone. And for survivors of distress and adversity that we remember, what lies behind us and what lies ahead of us are small matters compared to what lies within us. As a very wonderful doctor once said to me, don't tell me what other people have told you about yourself. Tell me about you. Thank you.